Hey guys, today I just want to recap my win at uh, Big Sugar Gravel. I'm gonna explain you how the race played out, but uh, also my three secret weapon that I had in the race that I think are a big part of why I won the race. So Big Sugar is a gravel race that started in Bettenville and it was a 166 kilometer loop. Half of the course was in Arkansas and the top half was in Missouri. I guess the course was about 70% gravel, a little bit more than that. I say gravel, but it was mostly like super small roads with a pretty compact surface but with like super loose big rock on the surface. So the, the real danger was not really about um, slicing tires. The danger was more about um, hitting one of those rocks and really hitting the rim and uh, flatting because of that. It was not the hilliest course I did. So on the 166 kilometers, you had a total of about 2000 meters of elevation. Yeah, nothing more. They had a small cyclocross sector that they told us about just before the second feed zone. And I already did the last 50 kilometers before the finish. So I knew the last 50 were pretty good gravel actually the only reason I knew the gravel was really rough is because I, I talked to Andy Chasen. Andy is the photographer for uh, Pinarello for my uh, bike sponsor and uh, he told me out about the course and he was like Adam uh, this is really gonna be a hard course on the tires the gravel is really rough out there so um, that's the only reason actually why I knew and why I adjusted my equipment a lot just after hearing those um, secret insights. So Big Sugar was pretty much the last big gravel race of the season. It was not my last personally. I had planned to do the Belgian Waffle Ride Kansas the week after, but for most of the rider, it was their last big one. So um, on the start line, we had the usual suspect, we had Peter Stetna, we had Colin Strickland, we had Ted King, we had TJ Eisenhart, um, Cole Patton, you can check his YouTube channel. We had Griffin Easter that just was second in BWR Utah. We had John Keller from uh, Specialized. We had Alex Owen. I actually raced Alex a lot on the road. He's mostly a road cyclist uh, racing for wildlife generation. We had Dennis Van Widen. Dennis is a retired um, world tour pro cyclist. And we had the wild card that everybody was talking about. We had the uh, Nelson Prowless that just came from world. Nelson was fifth at world. So we knew he was in great shape and um, EF were putting a lot of support behind him. So Nelson was, um, I think in everyone's mind, the favorite because uh, Nelson has a background in mountain biking. So we all knew he was going to be able to ride his bike properly in the more technical sector. So um, yeah, a really strong field for sure. So the race started at 7 a.m. a little bit too early in my opinion. So sunrise was at 7.34. So we started in the dark, you could see the moon. It was actually pretty dangerous. So the first eight kilometers were on the road but it was like completely dark. Um, I was at the front just behind the motos and the car, so it was not that bad, but I can imagine the people behind. I mean, we were a group of like, I don't know, close to 2000 riders in the dark going like 25, 30 miles an hour in the downhill. So that was kind of sketchy. I would have started the race a little bit later. At eight kilometers, we had a left turn into the first gravel sector. And from there, the race was full on. Right when we entered the sector, Nelson didn't um, <laughs> didn't wait any time. And he just like went to the front and threw his first attack. So from then, I mean, heart rate was super high. Everybody was just like yeah, hanging on or attacking also because it was like exciting the feel and at this point of the race it's so early that everybody is feeling very good the adrenaline is high so um nelson was attacking but people were counter attacking people were going with him so it was like a very dynamic stage of the race even though it was like the first stage of the race 
And after that kind of hard uh, first part of the race, we had a selection of um, about 30 riders at the front. And then the pace like really slowed down. It was chill for a good 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it's always a little bit the same in a gravel race. You try to establish an early selection. So then you don't have to fight for position as much. And it's not as dangerous as it is if you're a group of like 80 in the gravel. At least a group of 30, a group of 20, you can always see the front and you can always kind of choose your line. So that's why it's like super important to make the pace hard from the beginning. So the group really like shorten super fast. So right after that, like more chill part, we had like a gradual climb. I guess it was around 5%, but it was like super loose. So you didn't have any draft because the pace was too slow. So that's where like Nelson like really put his first real move, I guess. So pretty much everyone was getting dropped. Uh, me and Pete were pretty much the only one able to follow it, like John. And I, I, I think I remember Cole also being able not to get gap, but that attack for sure created gaps. And I felt like from then on, people were getting distance in some of the humps or some of the short hill. And they really had to maybe go down a little bit faster that they would have if they didn't get drop. So I feel like for me, feeling as good as I was feeling, I was able to stay with Nelson or with Pete. So I didn't have to take any risk going down. I was able to like stay very calm, choose my line. But I think that a lot of guys were on the limit. So crashes happen and flat happen when you're going over what you can manage, especially going down because you cannot, like I said, choose your line as good. So you have less control, you're less smooth on the bike. So I think that for sure played a lot in all the flats, all the crashes that happened. Actually, just after that climb, we went down a super fast descent. And I think Ted King was one of the guys for sure that had the best equipment. And it was just like unlucky and um, I'm not sure what happened. I should actually ask him about it. I, I, I asked him about the crash, but not why it happened. And uh, Ted actually broke his shoulder. I knew it was a bad crash because Ted was just behind me and I, I heard not a, not a good sound. And um, actually fun story, um, TJ Eisenhardt was in the, the second group and he said that Ted was, um, I guess, on the side of the road bleeding. So um, TJ stopped. So Ted was like bleeding a lot from his elbow and uh, TJ like took his jersey to do a bandage. <laughs> I think that was like the best story of the race. So after Ted crash, kind of another selection was made. So we were like a very small group, like just under 10 riders. So it was like me, Pete, I think Cole was there, Nelson was there, Dennis was there, and we had John Keller and who else? I forgot his name. So this guy was with us also. That was kind of our group, so I think just under 10. And from now on, I knew this race was kind of going to play out as a strategic one that the first objective was to limit damage. So my first discipline was really to stay as focused as I could. I mean, in gravel, it's easier sometimes than in road, for example, because so much thing happening that it's easy to stay focused on that task. But still, it's like a super long way out there. So it's easy to just get lost a little bit in your thoughts sometimes or just, I mean, look at all the beautiful things around you so um i mean every time i would see myself just like be not as focused as i would want to be i would refocus my attention on the task at hand so really like the best line so my mantra was just the best line so how can i choose the best line in every moment and how can i be as smooth as possible to limit damage on the bike not too flat so i would always be literally like top two in the group or the first guy going into every descent. So that was uh, for sure pretty much everything that was happening in my mind at that point. So then we hit the first feed zone. So Pete and Nelson had 
someone there. Nelson stopped because he had an issue with his tires. So he actually came back with Peter. And at that point, we were a group of maybe seven riders. And the chemistry was very good because we knew the other guys were dropped, but we didn't knew how far they were. And like, you never know, like they can organize themselves pretty well and come back on you, especially when you have strong guys like Colin at the back, like they can form a good group and come back so that forced a really good dynamic between all of us so everyone was taking good pulls at the front we were rolling super fast also pete was doing the usual pete thing so every time we would hit a climb peter was just going to the front and putting a very not comfortable pace just so he could weaken everyone else legs but in my mind, Pete was my biggest ally at that point because I knew how far we had from the finish line. I think at that point we were a good 110k maybe from the line. I knew that Pete was a good ally because like I told you, you don't know if the guys at the back will come back on you. So having a guy that is as strong as Peter, you want to form an alliance early in the race so you can actually like take an advantage on everybody else. I guess just a little bit later, Nelson had to stop again. That's kind of when we lost him. So um, I'm not sure exactly what happened to him. I guess another mechanical for him, that's too bad. I wish we could have um, raced a little bit more because like I said, he went so hard at the start that um, he kind of showed everyone that he was there to win. He was there to put a statement. So um, it would have been nice to continue to race against him. But I feel that's the kind of situation that kind of always happen at your first gravel race. There's so much things that can turn bad in a gravel race. And I feel like it did for Nelson. He didn't have the best luck on that day, but um, he was for sure riding very well. So at that point, Nelson is not there anymore. Uh, we're a group of six. There was like a kind of a water crossing. So you had to go down a really short like drop. You go down that, you took a left hard turn and then you kind of cross like a small, super small bridge. And after that, you went up a super steep hump and you were back on the road. And on that technical sector, me and Pete form a gap on uh, everyone else. So we were just the two of us in front. So we rode together very good. I was like, maybe I'll just go with Pete until the finish and see whoever is stronger. But um, I saw that Pete tires was kind of getting lowered and um, I guess he was happy to keep riding it. But at one point he, he like stopped taking relay and he was sagging a little bit. And I kind of figured out that he kind of had a problem. So in that time, the other guys came back on us. So the group was back at like six and uh, we rode. But like I said, Pete was like unsure about his tires, but he was not getting off the bike. But at one point he had to. And from now on, I was really like in the mindset of like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can beat all those guys. So I just need to be very smart, avoid <laughs> any damage, being super focused, being super careful, not taking any risk. So then we rode the five of us for a really long time until like the 70k mark from the finish and on every climb me and John were really putting a high pace and putting pressure on the guys so at one point Luke got dropped and Dennis got dropped apparently Dennis got dropped because of a flat it was like a super long climb and on that top of the climb I was by myself with John at like I guess 60k to go and then we went down that like cyclocross part that I told you about at the beginning, just before the second feed zone. So at the second feed zone, we followed everyone and John Garmin like kept beeping and it was like, we need to turn back, we need to turn back. But I had my Brighton and I was like, we're on the right track right now. So I didn't really understand. <laughs> So John almost turned back, but finally decided to stay with me. So we went up that climb super hard. Then you went down a descent and you went up another climb. And I think John had uh, his chain go off or something. So we had to stop on the side of the road for like 10 seconds. So at that point we had a 10 second gap on each other. And I was like, we have 50K to go from the finish and he doesn't have TT bars. I have my TT bars. So I was pretty confident in myself. So I was like, it's the time. So I went super hard on the last sector of that uphill. And from then on, I was just like, I have 50K to go. I'm first on the road. 
it's TT mode, the thing I love. By that point, I was just by myself in the TT bar racing against John, but also being worried about Pete and Nelson, everybody else, because I didn't know how far they were. Like, I mean, you can change a flat with a plug in literally 30 seconds. So in my head, I was like, if Peter is back with Nelson or if Dennis is back with Luke Hall and two other guys, like they can come back on me. So I was just riding as hard <laughs> as I could. So like I told you at the beginning, the last 50K were pretty fast gravel and we had a tailwind. So I was just like in the TT bars in my TT mindset. At first I was like, ah, this is gonna be hard. I mean, 50K of TTing is like a good one hour and 30 of pure pain, but um, it was not too long for me to just get in the right mindset and remember that doing a TT by myself at the front of that big of a race is just like what I train for, what I always crave. So, I mean, I was taking the pain all in. I was not trying to push it away or anything. I was just like embracing it as much as I can. Like I was just telling myself that in those moments, that's where you're really alive. You're gonna remember this moment for a long time. So I was just going all in, giving everything I have. And I also had the, the thing in my head of uh, remembering your mortality. And I was like, a moment like that is not gonna happen forever. So don't resist it, just take it all in. Like I said, it was a painful moment, but also a great moment, especially when you think about it. So I finally crossed the line five minutes between the second place rider. <laughs> you don't have any gap, so it's hard to like gauge how hard you need to go. So I just went as hard as I could because you don't know if people are 20 seconds back or five minutes back. And I was really treating the effort like a TT. So I was not looking back. I was just really focused on giving everything I had and like making sure my pacing was good and also making sure my line choice was good. And so, yeah, I crossed the line. It's, it's funny, like you imagine those moments and you think as soon as you'll cross the line, you'll feel a wonderful feeling or you'll feel the excitement or everything. But actually I was like so empty that I crossed the line and I was just like, I was happy that I was not like yelling or anything. I was just like, ah, just like happy. Actually, I was traveling and uh, sharing a hotel room with uh, Dan. Dan is one of my good friends now that I met in SBT Gravel. And uh, Dan came in maybe two hours and a half after me. So I was all changed and everything. And he, he came in from his race and he was like, how did it go? So I was like, I won. And Dan was like super happy for me. And like, it was a great moment for both of us for sure. So now, like uh, I promised for my secret weapon for the race, I think those decisions truly made a difference. So I would say that the first secret weapon that I had was my tire insert. I had the Kush Core, I'm not sponsor or anything, but I had that in my tires. So um, like I told you, it was like big rocks that you would hit. And uh, I know that the majority of the guys flatted because they hit a big rock and it like smashed their rim or something. And I actually like smashed the Kush Core four or five times. But I guess the Kush Core for sure helped. It's for sure heavier. So in a course that you cannot really have flat or in a course that's super hilly, I would maybe not took the decision to ride them, but I think for this course, it was the perfect choice. Also having the Kush Core, you can run a little bit lower pressure. So rather than running like uh, 30, 32, depending on the tire, I was able to run like 27, 28. My second secret weapon was my TT bars for sure. So I wasn't sure about that decision because everybody was telling me, no, don't take the TT bar, it's too technical out there. You're never gonna use them. And also like if you're trying to win, you're more likely to be in a group for pretty much all the race and you don't really use your TT bar if you're in a group because you're drafting and everything and it's just not safe. But I kind of had the feeling that if people were starting to get flat, I would most likely be by myself at one point. So I was like, I think it's worth it. And I also had in mind to uh, do an attack at the end. Maybe not that far from the finish, but I was like, if I'm in a small group, depending on who's with me, I'll maybe try to go early and uh, try to TT myself to the finish because I'm confident in my ability to TT, especially if I have my TT bars. For sure, the TT bars are heavier, but I think in that case, looking back on it, it's easy to say it was worth it, but in my mind, it was still worth it be before I had the result. 
And the last secret was the motor pacing session I did with my uh, good friend Olivier Saint Denis and supporter of me. So we did four crucial motor pacing session on the gravel bike. So Olivier has a knee bike and he has made modifications so that he bike can go really fast. Uh, it's not luck. So we did like those crazy gravel ride, like super fast me behind him. I think we would average over 35k an hour and we just 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 went all in. I just killed myself during those sessions. Most of the time I would like ride there, do a like three hour loop with Olivier and come back and uh, it was so hard and I think those motor pacing session for sure help you in your cadence the way you pedal but I think the big thing for me especially in Big Sugar it really helped me with being comfortable but also smooth at high speed so I think those motor pacing session were a big reason why I was actually being able to stay smooth and comfortable and avoid flats. So yeah, that's about it for this recap. I hope you liked it. I'm sorry for not having footage of the race. I hope it was still understandable. If you have feedback to how I can improve those recap videos, I would strongly appreciate if you tell me. Other than that, thank you very much for listening. I would suggest Big Sugar, but make sure you have great equipment if you're planning to do it. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. As usual, take care of yourself by making the most optimal choice in every moment and do the same to take care of the ones you love.